side, the state, must continue to shape the narrative. And shaping the narrative is not a question of mere triumphalism. It is also a question of reconstruction and reconciliation. Social reconstruction or social reconciliation is of paramount importance in a separatist or an ethnic insurgency. If you want to restore legitimacy and have a harmonious society, reintegrating the population, and it's not only reintegration of population, it is everybody, whether it's the dominant uh, uh, social, uh, social class or ethnic class, uh, community, must see the others as equal citizens. Any country facing the possibility of serious ethnic fissures within its society and manages to transcend that has to develop effective reconstruction and what we call social reconciliation approaches. And also this requires shaping and dominating the narrative. You cannot give that up. And this requires that a government creates a cadre of what we call information warriors. Both, they can be both civilian and military. The, the military are applicable to the shooting side of the war and the civilian cadre come into, uh, not that they're not active before, but they come into their own after uh, the shooting war is over. In this context, when we look at this aspect, and I, I, and I, I deal with this in detail because, as I said, when I looked at all my cases, um, even uh, going back to uh, ones in the uh, uh, early 20th century, governments almost invariably have a problem with information operations in, in terms of shaping and dominating the narrative. And being inflexible organs, organizations, it takes them a long time to recognize the value of it. This is one thing. Now, if you are what I call a third-party intervener in a, uh, in a insurgency like the United States, Britain, and Australia, and other countries who are involved in Iraq and Afghanistan, that inflexibility of militaries and uh, uh, civilians in, in terms of trying to create an effective narrative to overraw and dominate that of the insurgents is magnified by what we can refer to either as cultural arrogance, blindness, or ignorance. If you're an outsider coming to a country that you have very little knowledge of and you want to help the government beat its... Um, non-state, beat its insurgent opponents, you can actually end up magnifying your problem and that of the host or uh, state or your ally. Because you're going in there and you're blundering like an elephant for several years. As you begin, it takes a while to transcend what I call that lack of cultural uh, empathy. Which is n not a uh, a problem that is just afflicting Western nations. It afflicts anybody who's helping another side that is dealing with violence within their own territory. Because you do not have that cultural knowledge and it takes a while to develop it. And you will cause problems for yourself by your lack of cultural empathy. Greater damage, loss of life, and you actually help delegitimize the government you're trying to help which raises the issue of the third party intervener. Is, he, is it better for that state to have a small footprint or a large footprint? If you look at some of the most successful counterinsurgency campaigns by third parties of the 20th century, I think you would agree that a small footprint can actually be much better than a larger footprint. The British and the Americans helped the Greek government defeat the Greek communists um, on the, on, uh, the uh, onset of the Cold War without essentially occupying the country en masse. 
The United States helped the Philippines defeat a communist insurgency, the Hook Rebellion, without a large footprint. The government of Oman was helped by the British and Jordanians and others to defeat a communist insurgency in Dofar without a massive footprint by foreigners. So th these are critical factors that states, and I include my own country, has to consider when trying to help a foreign power defeat an internal threat. Then there's the issue which is very, very important in the context of irregular war and will be increasingly important in the 21st century. It's the notion of intelligence, or I, I like to call it information gathering, then that becomes an intelligence product because it's a bit of a misnomer when you're gathering intelligence, to, uh, information, to call it intelligence. It has to be, it has to be formatted, it has to be addressed and assessed before it becomes intelligence. Most government intelligence, intelligence organizations, military or civilian, are not, particularly military ones, are not optimized for dealing with irregular warfare. They're optimized in the typical uh, Walsian image of the state of looking at other states. They're trained that way as well. Things are beginning to change, of course, as countries like the US, Australia, Britain have realized that uh, information, uh, that uh, intel uh, gathering is a, social, is a social endeavor as well, not measure, uh, bean counting. These failures of intelligence, of information gathering, were evident in all the cases that I have compared and contrasted uh, uh, Sri Lanka with um, across time. They were quite evident in Sri Lanka in the 1980s as well. There's an aspect to it where because governments tend to want to downplay an insurgency breaking out, not enough uh, resources from the intelligence sector are devoted to it, but that changes over time. However, the training is an on the sort of cuff training that uh, officers receive, and it's not a radical cultural break with uh, what I call conventional intelligence gathering. And I'll give you an example here from some of the declassified British reports on the intelligence uh, gathering operations of the Irish War of Independence. The British officers who went to Ireland uh, in the first stages um, had been trained in conventional warfare, and they had been focused for the past four years, 1914 to 1918, to deal with conventional threats posed by the uh, Central Powers and posed by the Ottoman Empire, not by irregular actors. So when they turned up to Dublin and the rest of Ireland, their focus was, okay, where is the IRA's ORBAT, order of battle? It was not really readily available or visible. It was the people. And on top of what we call the cultural uh, ignorance, you have cultural arrogance that which may stem, and this everybody's subject to, bar none, the cultural ar uh, ignorance is also, to, uh, what is added to that is also what we call the racial blinkers. If you're a British intelligence officer in 1918, 1919, the Irish was essentially not on a par with an Englishman. So you, that means your capacity to engage in social information gathering is reduced by your organizational deficiencies and your own cultural deficiencies of adopting superior airs towards the population that, uh, from which you're trying to gather intelligence. Now this has happened without fail through the 1920s. It happened in Iraq when we went to Iraq, underestimating the Iraqi capacity for irregular war, under, estimate, uh, underestimating their uh, resilience, and so on. 
So, it, if I just w I think I have a few more minutes, and I just want to end up again with reiterating, you know, the the the, the non-kinetic aspect of irregular war, the intelligence aspect and the new media aspect. And, and just let me briefly say uh, just a few more points on this before I uh, cede the uh, floor. Uh, 